Hi, it's Dwyer, April the 24th, 2018. Gamblersadvisory.com, free site. DwyerVIP.com, free site. Let's talk about a fighter that I'm changing my opinion on. This guy really impressed me in his last fight. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, to me, boxing is kind of like basketball in an important aspect, right? Let's say you're on a court and you're sticking someone. You're playing defense. This person's right in front of you. In my opinion, the most dangerous basketball player is the one who, when he has the ball, you don't know what he or she is going to do, right? You're looking at them and you know. They can go left or right, right? You know if they drive past you, the person has the skills. Even with other people on your team underneath the basket, person has the skills to drive all the way to the hole and lay it up in traffic, right? The person also has the skills after they've driven by you to what we used to call stop and pop, right? They have the mid-range game. They can go right or left. They have a left hand if they're right-handed. They have a right hand if they're left-handed, right? If the person can do a fadeaway, when they're in front of you. In other words, you don't know if they're going to drive by you. You don't know if they're going to go backwards and take the shot on you. Right? If the person has an outside J that they can just take a step back and hit. Think James Harden. Right? Big part of his game. That take a step back and hit the three shot that he has. Then you know you have your hands full, right? Let's say the person can drive by you, but he decides to play back to the basket on you and can back you in and work you over that way, Tim Duncan style. You're pretty much finished, right? In other words, the great players have a multiplicity of skills, right? As good a finisher as Michael Jordan was, right? Nobody drove to the basket, at least during my life, better than Michael Jordan. Jordan had one of the best turnaround jumpers in recent memory, right? LeBron James, as good as he is driving to the basket, has three-point range. Take a look at his three-point shooting percentage, which, of course, is much higher than Russell Westbrook's. Right? So when I'm looking at a boxer, I want to believe that the boxer is unpredictable to his opponent. In other words, if I see a fighter who is front foot heavy, right, who you know is going to try to walk down an opponent, that doesn't impress me as much as let's say a Terrence Crawford, who not only can fight you from the outside, in addition to fighting you from the inside, but can go righty or lefty depending on what the situation requires. Right? So I see a lot of fighters who have great fastballs, I'll call it. We'll throw in baseball here. Right? The guy has a certain style that has worked for him on the way up front foot heavy, certain punch, right? Batters you up on the ropes. I see guys like that now with belts. Errol Spence, for example, right? Great on his front foot, great throwing hooks to your body, great when he has you backed up against the ropes. I'd be more impressed with Errol Spence if I saw a back foot game where Errol Spence walked you into traps, right? Think Juan Manuel Marquez, right? Errol Spence decides, hey, I'm not going to be on my front foot because sometimes 
you're going to run into an opponent like a Manny Pacquiao who's going to make you pay for that. Right? A James Tony who's going to make you pay for that. So I like fighters who then say to themselves, okay, you know what? I'm going to back up here. But I'm going to have it so as I back up, when this guy comes forward, I'm going to have something for him. In other words, I'm backing up with a purpose, with a plan. Now, let me say, Gravante Davis is a fighter who I criticized here online. He looked like, again, let's use a baseball analogy. He looked like a fastball pitcher to me. Right? He's southpaw. He hits hard. He has a great right hand. His nickname was Tank. They don't nickname you Tank if you can operate on your back foot. Right? No one thinks of Tanks backing up. They think of Tanks coming forward. Right? Destroying you. So I saw Gravante Davis. And I noticed Gravante Davis was coming forward all the time. Right? The fact that he was a southpaw is the kind of thing that would throw off a lot of opponents on the way up. Right, A lot of the guys he fought, I'm sure, weren't ready for a power-hitting southpaw. I looked at his footwork, and I noticed his front leg was stiff. I thought I could tell just looking at his feet when he was going to throw punches. Right, Keep in mind, if you're going to come forward, to throw power punches, you need to plant that front leg. When you have a stiff leg, people can watch it and say, oh, he's planting it now. He's going to throw a power shot, right? I thought Gravante Davis was very predictable on film, right? And based on the articles I had read, I thought he was what I call a size guy. In other words, big for the division. A guy who squeezed himself down, and by the way, you can only do this when you're young, right? Squeezed himself down into a lower division so that he could make weight. Then, of course, by the time the fight happened, he's much bigger. He's a bigger man. He was mauling smaller opponents. Let me also say, too, that his record looked inflated to me. Right? In his eighth fight, his eighth fight, keep in mind, Davis is unbeaten today. So when Davis was 7-0, and he fought a guy who was making his boxing debut. Right? Understand, here's where it's a little bit different than the NBA. Right? You see LeBron James and he's always playing against NBA opponents. Right? The guys he's destroying have actually made the big leagues with him. In boxing, understand you don't have that standardization. Right? A win's not really a win early in a guy's career because that win may have come against an opponent who is hopelessly inexperienced, who's not even at the same level of their career. So, Gervonta Davis in his eighth fight fought a guy who let's just say was inexperienced, hadn't fought before, zero and zero record. For his ninth fight, Gervonta Davis fought a guy with one, two, three, four, five. you know what, I'm not even going to count because it would take too long. He fought a guy in his ninth fight who had 31 losses, right, 31 losses. So you can imagine, I'm looking at Gervonta Davis's resume when he fights Cristobal Cruz. Cruz had not won in his prior five fights. Right? Davis's resume seemed to have a lot of cherry picked opponents on it. Right? So I saw the guy in the ring, I saw a stiff front leg, I saw a guy, heavy puncher, right? Heavy puncher. But the guy was always coming on his front foot, right? I thought, okay, you know, at this level, someone's going to hop in the ring and say, hey, I fought southpaws before, right? At this level, 
the opponents are a lot better than guys making they, their debuts or guys with 31 losses, right? I thought reality was going to catch up with Gervonta Davis. In fact, when Davis went across the ocean to fight Liam Smith, I thought Liam Smith was going to win that fight, right? I knew Davis hit harder, but I just thought Davis wasn't fully ready. Well, let me just say, and I don't say this lightly, right? Guys grow up right in front of you. Some guys, when they hit the world championship level of boxing, in other words, they become contenders. They become champions. They're fighting guys ranked by sanctioning bodies. When they hit that part of their career, some guys wilt, right? You can tell the guy was, dare I say, what we call a club fighter. That's the phrase in boxing. Other guys surprise you, right? They lift their games. They develop new skills. Now, the last fight again, uh, that Gervonta Davis had against, I believe, the opponent's name was Jesus Cuellar. He really surprised me. That's the best I've seen him look. Right? Understand, Davis in that fight is on his back foot. You can imagine how shocked I, I was looking at the film. Davis, who, in my opinion, still leans forward a bit too much, that head's a bit exposed. But at least in this fight, Davis is moving the head. Davis is aware of the need to move his head. Understand, the problem with sluggers, guys who have very high KO percentages, is they think life is as simple as showing up, hitting you upside the head, watching you fall down and leaving. Right? The subtleties of boxing, the whole sweet science part, that's for somebody else. Right? So you'll notice guys who are sluggers, right? Julian Jackson back in the day, right? Will often have heads that don't move. Why would they move their heads? Many of these guys have never been tested, right? They hit championship level and they're surprised when bullets start coming back at them. Right? I'm sure many of these guys are thinking, wow, is this sport really dangerous? Right, The people around them, dare I say the fan club around them, because I've never encountered a group that gets less accurate feedback than boxers. Right, The, the groups around them who are paying their bills based on the money the fighter is bringing in always want to convince the fighter that the fighter is the next Sugar Ray Robinson. Also understand a hard truth in boxing, right? A lot of these guys start off at the local gym. In other words, you know, they're looking for direction. Many guys are from very tough neighborhoods. In other words, you don't have a lot of wealthy people saying, hey, let's get into boxing. No, often these fighters are from broken homes. They're from high crime areas. Right? The career choices are, you know, limited. They'll see their friends getting into trouble. Maybe they themselves got into trouble. Right? Look up boxing history. You're going to find that people like Carlos Monzon had colorful pasts. Right? People like Bernard Hopkins spent time in prison. Right? So often, the young fighter just goes to the local gym. And there's some well-meaning guy in the local gym who, you know, is training the fighters, right? That guy might be, you know, just a community leader type guy who's trying to get young men off the street, right? Who, who are trying to provide young men with an opportunity and some discipline system where the young man can learn that if you put in the work, you might get the rewards later, right? So 
these young guys then end up with really father-son relationships with the trainer at the local gym. And that trainer might look impressive. The trainer might be a former Boy Scout leader or a former cop or something like that, right? But that doesn't mean that the trainer is a world-class trainer. That doesn't mean that the trainer is going to be able to teach the fighter a lot of good habits. That doesn't mean the trainer is going to be able to help the fighter avoid a lot of bad habits. I'll even go further. It doesn't even mean that the trainer at the local Y or whatever, at you know the ABC gym down the street, even knows what a world-class fighter looks like. Right? So understand, when you're fighting guys who are making their debut in your eighth fight and guys with 31 losses in your ninth fight, you might look like Sugar Ray Robinson on the local scene. That doesn't mean you're going to look like Sugar Ray Robinson on the world stage against a champion or against a big time contender. Let's just say though that Gervonta Davis has a lot of talent. That's obvious from his last fight. I was looking at his footwork. It's vastly improved. I know he lost the title on the scales. Right, which is the worst way to lose a title. Right? I mean, if they strip you for whatever reason, right, at least it doesn't look like you didn't take the sport seriously enough to make weight. Right? I get that. I get that Davis has had setbacks. But let me just say he's in a much better place today, even without the title. He's in a much better place today. I was looking at his footwork. I couldn't tell if he was coming forward or going backward. Right? In, in basketball terms, I couldn't tell if he was going to go left or go right. I was looking at him on his back foot. I was looking at him rolling his shoulders. And I thought, wow. You know, I know he beat some very impressive fighters. He beat Jose Pedraza. Right? Very skilled fighter. Right? Who couldn't hit the fastball Davis was throwing at him. But understand, Davis right now is learning how to pitch. Right? He has a new trainer, Kevin Cunningham. Apparently, he's sparring and training with Adrian Broner. Right? It shows. Right? It shows. He's clearly doing things that he didn't do before. Let me also say too, and I don't say this lightly, punchers are born, they're not made. Right? Just like the guys throwing 100 in the big leagues. I'm just telling you, right? No one would be able to get a guy throwing 85 to throw 100 miles an hour. The guy has to be damn near right around 100 for someone to be able to add, you know, two or three miles per hour on that fastball to get him into triple digits. It's the same way with punching, right? You'll see some guys, Rocky Marciano, his feet don't look set. He looks like he's awkward. He hits guys, they fall out the ring. He hits guys, they go to sleep. Right? That's the way punchers are. Right? Gervonta Davis is a born puncher. If he continues to improve his skill set, as well as the punches he throws. This is a guy who throws a great hook. He can throw a straight left. He can throw a nice uppercut with his lead hand, even. Right? If this guy continues to figure out how to frame his punches, he's going to be awfully dangerous. Now, I know online, let me, let me touch on something else. Right? I know online people are, you know, saying that his promoter um, threw him into the deep end of the pool. I know Davis himself 
is trying to say that for one of his IBF championship fights, right? He wins the belt against Pedraza. He defends the title against Liam uh, Walsh, right? Did I say Liam Smith earlier? It's Liam Walsh. Okay, I know, I know that Davis feels that he had to do it on his own. That he was thrown to the wolves a bit too early. Right? What I want everyone here online to understand is that that's the boxing world. Right? Opportunities don't come around that often. Right? If you're a promoter and you sign a guy who has a resume like this guy, right, where he's fighting fighters making their debut in his eighth pro fight, right? You see a lot of wins, you see the punch, you see the stiff leg, you see the predictability. I'm talking about old Gervonta Davis, right? You see the big head that really can't get out of the way that he has leaning forward. Contrast that, by the way, with, let's say, a Vitaly Klitschko or a guy who knows how to use, use length, Demetrius Andre, who has his head back. You have to go through his body to hit his head. Right? And Ali, when he wanted to, has a jab out and has his head back here. You see Davis, Davis's head's right here. Right? He's cleaning that up now. But if you're the promoter, understand you're in the business of making money. Right? You're in the business of making money. You have a guy who might be the real deal, might not be the real deal. Understand, you don't really know because he hasn't been playing against other athletes who are in a professional sports league, right? You can tell in basketball whether a guy has it after you see him for a while playing against NBA opponents in NBA games. You don't know that in boxing because the guy is fighting Tom, Dick, and Harry making his debut, right? Joe with 31 losses. So when you get an opportunity to recoup your investment, I know no promoter is going to own up to this, but when you have an opportunity at a title shot with your young fighter who might be the real deal, in which case he wins the title, or might not be the real deal, in which case you're getting the money that comes from a championship match, then you have to take that opportunity, right? Every fighter needs to realize that the agenda of their promoter is different, very different than their agenda, right? The fighter, of course, has confidence. The fighter, of course, believes he is the next Sugar Ray Robinson. Why wouldn't he? He's the man at the local gym run by the police officer. Right? He's, he's the guy who is winning by knockout. Fighter himself might not realize that the guy he's fighting has 31 losses. Right? The promoter, by contrast, is running a business. He has a young fighter on the way up. The promoter doesn't know if this young fighter can beat all of the top contenders. Right? You pass on a shot at the title, and then you have your prospect lose a lower-paying fight to some contender. Right? You have your prospect exposed in a fight where even the prospect starts to realize, I'm not Sugar Ray Robinson. In fact, I have holes in my game. I need, I need more of a back foot. I need to get my big head out of the way of shots, right? Promoters don't want to take that chance. Ready or not, sometimes fighters have to step in the ring against champions, not just for titles, but for financial reasons, right? So. All of these people online who are saying, oh, the promoter only cares about themselves. Let me just say, welcome to capitalism. 
right? Play at your own risk. If you're signing a contract with a promoter, understand up front, the promoter has his own agenda. Hell, if you're signing a contract with your manager, understand the manager might have his own agenda, right? In my opinion, that's why. That's why fighters need to have both eyes open. They need to make sure that they have a trainer who can help them mold their game. Right? Hey, the father-son relationship with the, you know, cook who's running the local gym. Hey, that's nice. Great. You know, keep that person in your entourage. But if you want to be world class, you need to get with a world-class trainer. And then you need to be smart enough to listen to the guy. Right? Food for thought. Don't rely on your promoter. The promoter is just trying to get a big fight that'll sell tickets. Right? I, I get the feeling many of these fighters think that their promoters are their friends. Folks, no. They're people you have a business deal with. Right? Food for thought. So, let me just close by saying Gervonta Davis has lifted his game. I can't tell if he's going to go right or left watching him in front of a fighter. I'm not saying his last opponent was a very dangerous opponent, but let's just say his footwork is much better. He always has a puncher's chance in every fight that he has. He's sparring with a multiple champion, right? A guy with very good defensive skills. Now, I'm not sure if Davis is ready to fight Vasyl Lomachenko, right? I certainly don't consider Davis to be Jorge Linares, who, by the way, I'm picking over Lomachenko, right? But let's just say the fight he had this weekend was the best I've seen him. I know he lost his belt on the scales. But this guy is all about boxing. You don't lift your game like this unless you're hard at work, right? I don't feel that Davis is blinded by the bright lights and thinks it's all about being a celebrity on TMZ, right? I get the feeling this guy understands that boxing is a craft. He's clearly listening to Kevin Cunningham, his trainer, who trains Devin Alexander, trains Adrian Broner, right? Food for thought. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Um, I'm keeping Gervonta Davis on my radar. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.